All right. So, and the reason why we talk about this, I think last class I mentioned that you can be really good at using the software, but if you don't know exactly what you're doing when you're using the software, it doesn't always help. So knowing the software doesn't make you a good designer. It's kind of understanding the principles and why you make certain decisions that makes you the good designer. So uh, today we'll be looking at structure and organization in terms of graphic design. So uh, why we make images a certain size. We're gonna talk about hierarchy. We're gonna be talking about a variety of different things in terms of the organization of a good, of a good graphic, okay? And so we'll relate this to graphic design, or both graphic design and to our portfolio. So when we talk about, when we do demonstrations, we're gonna be kind of going back and forth between what our next assignment is, which is the DVC lecture series poster, and then also <coughs> working towards our, our portfolio, which we'll actually talk about more next class and the following class. Um, let's see. So, with that said, we have a couple new assignments that were posted today. Today we're going to be working on exercise 12, which is the architecture program postcard. Uh, both exercise 12 and assignment 3 are closely related. They're both uh, focusing mostly on graphic design, okay? So not so much creating the content, but more of the organization of the content is what we're going to be focusing on for these next couple assignments, okay? So the architectural program postcard, which you guys will work on after the lecture today, is a, four, a typical postcard size, four by six inch uh, piece of paper or layout inside Inde or InDesign. You guys can use the DVC architecture, where what you're doing is you're creating an architecture program postcard that advertises the architecture program here at DVC, okay? So kind of pretend to put yourself in the mindset that maybe you're walking around DVC, you're a new student, uh, you don't know what you want to do yet, and uh, you know someone is handing you kind of an information flyer on the architecture program here at DVC. So use the DVC or dvcarchitecture.com website to kind of gather your resources in terms of content. So you guys can uh, feel free to just copy the content from the website. You don't need to write your own you know editorial on on the DVC architecture program. So feel free to borrow from that website. You can also borrow images from the website. You can also go on Google and find your own images, okay? You can just type in general architecture program and you'll probably find plenty of images that you can use for this postcard, okay? So that is on a four by six sheet of paper. You're gonna wanna go back and look uh, at everything that we've learned so far in terms of InDesign to create that, all right? Including what we learned today, all right? We'll have one more lecture on InDesign where we focus actually one, two, maybe two more lecture, lectures on InDesign where we're gonna focus a little bit more on the portfolio Wednesday and I believe Monday as well, okay? So that's exercise 12. You guys can read the instructions on the exercise. We'll give you a little bit more details. The other thing that I posted was assignment number three, okay? Assignment number three is the DVC lecture series poster, okay? So assignment 12 is more like the practice, okay? Use that as the practice. Of course, put good effort into it, but it's kind of the precursor to assignment three, which is really what after today's lecture and after the lecture on Wednesday, you'll ultimately really use to create the ultimate DVC lecture series poster, okay? Uh, next class, I will, maybe today, depending on how much time we have, I will show you some examples of what people have done for assignment three. Um, last year was really, or last semester was really nice because there was a big giant stack of them here on my desk for the actual DVC lecture series. That was a great reference, but I'll show you some examples of what that might look like. But this is gonna be an 11 by 17 graphic document that you will create to advertise a lecture series here at DVC. So they're both very similar, or they're both very related in, in several ways, but um, remember the assignment is worth a lot more points. So definitely put in the more time and effort into the assignment versus, uh, versus the exercise, okay? Any questions about any of those? Good, before we start? All right, let's get going. Okay, so today we're gonna to be focusing on the structure and organization of graphic design, okay? And as I mentioned, we're gonna relate it uh, both towards our next two assignments, and we'll also relate it towards our portfolio, 
which we will slowly uh, start to work on, okay? Um, lots more to come on the portfolio. So, what organizational system? We're going to talk about a couple different organizational systems today. The, the main one that we're going to focus on a majority of the time, and I'll probably reference the most throughout the semester, is the basic grid system uh, in terms of organizing your data for your portfolio. Okay. We'll also talk about some, a couple other various um, non, uh, not quite as structured organizations. Uh, systems throughout the semester but the grid system is really you know it's it's what I initially learned when I made my first portfolio and for those that maybe don't have a strong graphic background it's the perfect system to really start with okay it's I wouldn't say it's foolproof but it's uh, it's easy to understand it's easy to kind of get your uh, to start your your first kind of layout when it comes to your portfolio and it'll give you a good organizational system for a majority of what you do, okay? So that's gonna be the basic grid system, okay? So before we start, before we really get into that, let's talk about kind of the anatomy of the grid system, okay? So the grids, are, in general, grids are used to define the active area of a page. So when we set up a grid system, it defines uh, the general area that we're gonna be working on throughout the entire portfolio, okay? It directs the viewer toward visual elements. So our organizational system that we end up sitting will automatically or naturally, or your goal at least, is to allow the viewer to naturally be drawn to certain elements, okay? So depending on how you organize the grid, you'll start to create a visual hierarchy uh, between your different elements. So grids may vary in size depending on the format, okay? So we'll talk about uh, why you might pick a larger versus a smaller grid today and sometimes grids contain subordinate elements like footers and folios so more to come on all of that here shortly so you're gonna see this graphic uh, used quite a bit today you'll see it probably about five or six times because we're gonna talk about each of these five different elements okay so this is kind of the basic with minus all of the content that you would eventually place into it this is kind of your basic grid that's broken down into a variety of different elements okay we just mentioned margins a second ago we're gonna talk about flow lines which are kind of uh, which are horizontal uh, organizational elements we're gonna talk about columns we're going to talk about column intervals, which is the space between the columns, and we're going to talk about grid modules, being all the little individual squares. So first, we're going to talk about columns. Okay, Everyone here is probably familiar with columns. We've all read newspapers. We've all read magazines. We've all seen kind of the, you know, the basic column uh, organizational element when it, in terms of graphic design. Okay, Columns act as vertical divisions of space used to align the visual elements. Okay, They may divide a page. Sometimes you have one column, sometimes you have two, three, four, depending on the, if you're looking at a newspaper, maybe even five columns. The reason why we use columns is to actually break up the content in the page. So for example, you have an English paper that's one column and we'll actually have an example of this here in a second. When you have an English page, it's one column. It's text from one side of the page to the next. But uh, the problem with single columns is that if you have really long, uh, if you have really long documents, say you have like a 10 page essay, it becomes a little taxing to read, okay? It's hard or it's actually easy to lose interest with one uh, with single columns because your eye is jogging from uh, such long distances from side to side, okay? Whereas if you have smaller columns like a newspaper, it's really easy to document quick little jolts of information, whether it be a couple sentences or you're trying to make a write a quick paragraph with kind of short points. Uh, those shorter, narrower columns become the um, the organizational element of choice in terms of uh, plotting or in terms of writing larger amounts of information, okay? So widths may vary according to function in design, okay? Uh, an, English, an English essay being a, an example of a one column uh, grid versus a newspaper being multiple, okay? So here you can actually kind of see how that's starting to work. We have four columns in this example, uh, one, two in the middle, and one on the outside. So the anatomy of the grids, kind of the, uh, the continuation of this. Um, column intervals, also called gutter widths, okay? This is the space between your columns, okay? These are 
or column intervals in, are inactive negative spaces that separate one column to the next, all right? These prevent textual and visual elements from colliding. So when we were, um, you'll, an example of this is one when using the columns, when we were also placed last class, when you placed the images into, uh, into our graphics, and we actually started to create a separation between those. So column intervals work very much the same way as that in that they start to create negative space around the information that you're placing on your page. And we'll talk about the importance of negative space here in a few minutes. So here in this example, once again, our column intervals are represented by the space between all of our columns. So next, we have flow lines. Flow lines can be, uh, in my opinion, one of the more important visual, or one of the more important visual uh, organizational elements of a portfolio, okay? A flow line is a representation or supports vertical columns by dividing a page into uh, horizontal intervals. So looking at this graphic over here on the right, the flow line is represented by uh, this line that runs right here through the middle of the page, okay? And I'll show you lots of examples today of actual graphics and actual examples of portfolios where this becomes really apparent. But typically, a flow line separates usually larger areas of data, okay? You, or you might have two different things going on in each side of the page. And usually the full line, uh, when it intersects strong visual elements in a page, can act as kind of the, as the place where your eye starts reading a graphic, okay? Uh, so full lines provide additional alignment points as well. So here in this graphic here, this flow line is represented by uh, this pink line separating the four different columns. So next we have grid modules. Okay, grid modules act as spatial areas that support the textual and visual context of the design. And so the reason why we actually talk about the grid module is because it's, it's easy ability to expand from smaller to larger elements. Okay, and it's really easy, especially as a beginner, someone who has not uh, created a portfolio, it's really easy to uh, make images smaller and larger and, and, and find their correct location in your portfolio because you're working with kind of a static size and range throughout your portfolio. So the number of, of modules may vary from one design to the next. So in the example that you see over here on the right, this probably originally started with a, a variety of different grid modules. And let's actually go back to this image right here. This will help better explain. So the reason why we have, or the reason why that 16 grids works really well for this particular uh, slide is because of the ability to kind of take over a multiple grids at one time. So you might have uh, four images that take up these four slides, but you also may have an image that takes over all four of these slides. And you can start to expand that into a variety of different modules. And as you guys are doing this, the goal is usually not to make it so apparent that you have a grid system. Sometimes you'll see that, and you'll actually see some examples here in a second, where it's very clear that you're using a grid system as your organizational element. And that's not always a bad thing, but your goal is to kind of make it so that you can see it, but it's not super, super apparent. So we'll, sh we'll see We'll see examples of, of both of those here as we move on. So this, this example right here, obviously very clear that it's a grid system, but it's very easy to read, okay? And uh, it doesn't take a, you know, an absolute ton of thought in terms of where to place your different elements, okay? It's very easy in a portfolio to easily kind of get distracted and get sidetracked in terms of the overall organization. So. Um, when we move to InDesign later, we'll talk about how to set that up, how to create kind of a template of grids so that you can easily adapt them um, for your portfolio and future assignments. So, but if you look at this system right here, this is actually a nine module system, okay? The last one was 16, all right? We talked about a couple slides ago, the number of modules may vary from one design to the next. Um, one easy way to figure out the correct size of the module is if you were to place an image into your, into your design or into your layout, uh, start to think about what is the smallest I can place this image before, before it gets too small that you can't really easily identify what it is anymore, okay? So if it gets to the point where it gets too small, where it starts to, 
it's, it's, it's hard for you to make out exactly what's going on in the image. The grid system is too small, okay? And we'll talk about a few other ways here uh, that you can also easily tell. But this is a great example of that grid system. It's very apparent. Um, this might be, uh, this is actually very similar to my office, my office portfolio website. And, and the fact that I could kind of hover over each of these little squares, uh, it gives you a title for what that square might lead you to down over here. But you also have text, okay? You also have text that overlaps a variety of different modules, okay? So you can see here that they place their imagery all still easy to read, even though they're getting kind of small and they're probably close to the point where they might become a little hard to distinguish, but they're still, they're still large enough that you can make out what's going on, okay? And then they've placed some text that allows, or some text that takes over uh, a span of two different modules, okay? And they make that a consistent element as, as they proceed throughout their, uh, their portfolio, okay? So working with basic grids. Basic grids are used to unify and order the compositional space, okay? Um, it works really well because you're always gonna have that consistent uh, spacing throughout your document, as long as you identify what that is before you really get started, okay? So grids, uh, basic grids also act as the underlying structure that should be apparent without uh, being seen. So this is an example of where it's easily seen. And uh, we'll notice examples, actually, let's go back. Here's an example over here on the right where there's, there's obviously a grid system if I break it down uh, into its basic components, but it's not overly noticeable, okay? So this might have been, um, you know, maybe this was a series of a grid here, a grid here, and then they've kind of broken it into its smaller components, okay? So I can tell there was a grid system used, but it's not overly apparent, whereas this is a very overly apparent. Both are successful, but uh, personally, I try to not always make it super apparent. Basic grids can compose visual elements to balance and contrast the shape of the page, okay? So I usually like to relate my grid sizes also to or my grid sizes and their organization to kind of the general size and shape of my page. Uh, avoid arbitrary grids. Uh, when, I, when, you, when I say avoid arbitrary grids, um, tr try not to, um, actually I'm gonna come back to that one in just a second when I think I actually have a graphic that will support that a little bit better. Um, proportions of a grid should be based on page format and complexity of the visual elements, okay? So before setting up your grid, think about the kind of imagery and the kind of content that you're gonna be placing into your sheet. Do you have a lot of landscape images? Do you have a lot of por or portrait images? So think about the content that you're bringing in prior to kind of creating that underlying structure, okay? And so depending on what that is, might start to uh, help you figure out what, what your grid might look like. Okay, so when we talk about a grid, it doesn't always necessarily mean that we have perfect squares all the time either. So that's probably the first thing that we think of when we think of what a grid system is. Um, but it's not literally like imagine as if there was a sheet of graph paper behind your, behind your layout. Okay, we don't want it to be necessarily that apparent. So the, the complexity of the grid may vary depending on what your layout consists of and the shape of the um, spread that you're working with, okay? So functions of the grid. Functions of the, of the grid can uh, consist of control, organization, rhythm, harmony, unity, readability. Uh, well, that's, that's one I've been talking all day. That's a tough one to say. D dynam dynamism. That was created by my other, by, by the other teacher. Uh, balance, direction, contrast, interaction, order, and movement. Okay, and you guys can probably all add to this to this list. You can probably easily add double the number of elements to it. So first, we have single column grids. This is, so this was the example that I gave earlier when I was talking about kind of the basic English paper essay. So this is kind of the easiest uh, example to relate that to. This is perfect for large amount of continuous text. Okay, space is defined by the margins. Uh, not so much by things like flow lines, not so much by things like column intervals. Uh, you're really more focused on the margins on the outside of the page versus the other organizational elements that we've been talking about. Uh, margins are often used or often needed, or are, are often need adjustments, okay? 
So depending on the type of document that you're creating, whether it be like a legal document, uh, maybe it's a book, the margins often will change depending on what it is that you're creating. Okay, if you're typing an English essay that's just a single page and you're reading it uh, all the way down, your margins on the outside are likely to be the same, whereas the margins, or actually the, mar the margins all the way around your paper likely may be the same, whereas if you're writing a book, you all usually have a variety of margins to uh, counterbalance things like uh, the spine of the book and, and you know how one would flip through it. So here's an example of, of single column grids. This is uh, very classical. You sides and bottom, or the sides and the bottom uh, margins are often the same. Sometimes they vary a little bit. Top uh, is is smaller. Okay. The inner margin is typically half the width of the outer margin. Okay. So the inner margin is typically half of the width of the outer margin. And positions are mirrored in spread. Okay. This will start to make a little bit. Well, we'll start to relate this a little bit more to our portfolio when we start to look a little bit at layout. Okay. So. Notice here that this width right here, we'll call this 2, 2x, and this width over here in the middle is usually 1x, okay? So the inner, when you're working with single column margins or single column organization, your inner margin is typically uh, half of that of the outer margin, whereas the upper and the top margin is usually equivalent to the inner margin. So. This is a nice little, you know, how to grid system analysis that we're actually going to come back and look at here once we get back into InDesign. This works with the golden ratio. Has anyone ever used the golden ratio before? If you guys are in architecture school, you may have probably you've probably dabbled with it a little bit. I'll talk to you about what that is today when we're looking at InDesign. So this little grid how to system works with the golden ratio, um, and we'll, so we'll talk about how to actually set that up. But so step one through four is how you get to it. And you can see here step five actually starts to uh, show an example of what that might look like when you're placing in a little bit of content, okay? So you can see here uh, on the left-hand side, we have it broken into two single columns. We have one column on the left where you have t uh, little bits of text and also uh, little frames of where images might be placed. And you also have examples of where text is flowing from one side to the other. Okay, so what is that golden ratio? 0.618. That's a great number to remember. I still use it all the time, even when I'm putting together, you know, architectural sheets. I use it all the time. So it's a great ratio. It always, it always, for the most part, looks well. The composition always works when you use the golden ratio. So it's always a go-to, at least for me when I'm, when I'm uh, creating various graphics. So now we move to multiple column grids. Okay, this is probably what we're going to resort to more often in this class versus the single column grid as we're not gonna be writing any essays. I promise you no essays in this class. So we're gonna be focusing a little bit more on multiple column grids. Multiple column grids contain several spatial intervals. Intervals, okay? There are nearly endless compositional options, okay? So whether you do two, three, four, sometimes we have uh, diagonal columns, so there's various different ways of how uh, the composition might be organized when you are working with multiple column grids. This is suitable, or this is often the most suitable option for complex objects, or complex projects, sorry, um, because there are multiple ways to organize, or organize this. And as you start to uh, as you start to accumulate lots of content to organize into your project, you'll use this uh, more and more. Uh, multiple column grids can create movement, drama, rhythm, or even tension, okay? So let's kind of break this down. Let's, if we all kind of look at this, this graphic example, uh, let's break this down into the kind of the variety of different organizational elements that we've talked about. Uh, could someone tell me how many, how many columns do we see here in this graphic? And it can actually probably be interpreted a variety of different ways. First answer. Six. Yeah, I could I could definitely see six. So we have one over here on the left. Uh, we have four in the middle, and we have one on the right. I would actually interpret it uh, as four columns, four columns that we're actually using as active space. 
Okay, so we're actually using them to place a majority of the content, whereas the outer two columns might be more as used as margins, okay? Uh, and you can actually start to see some of those, uh, you can see margins kind of at the top and the bottom as well. So yeah, I could see six, I could definitely see six columns used to organize, or organize data in this particular graphic. Uh, can anyone maybe spot out where the flow line might be? How about someone on this side? Flow line. The very top horizontal line. Yes. Below, below yeah, what letter? P. Yeah, exactly. That's exactly correct. So it's right below the P. Okay. So notice that a majority of our data is um, on one side of that. Okay. So we probably have about eighty percent of the data that we're that we're um, that we're placing on this graphic is below that flow line. But one, something that I mentioned earlier is that usually the intersection between the flow line and one of the uh, vertical, the, one of the stronger vertical elements in our graphic is usually the focal point of where your eye is drawn to, okay? So if we look at this graphic and we look at where our flow line is and we look at what's the most apparent vertical element is gonna be this item right here, DAAP lecture series that creates our focal point to be right at this area right here. If I could draw on my screen, which I really, really want to, I'd be circling and putting an X right through that area right there. So when we start to look at the hierarchy of the different texts and the other different visual elements on the sheet, um, you can clearly see that this is where your eye wants to start reading, okay? So we start to read right here, DAAP lecture series, and then from there you kind of jump over to a variety of different elements. We start to look at some of the slightly smaller text, so we look at crossings, uh, crossings foundation, material, revolution, etc., etc., and then we start to go down to the even smaller text that starts to talk about the different uh, lectures that are going to be held at this particular event. Okay, so key key visual uh, visual aid in terms of organization is is where your flow line is and that vertical element that creates that strong contrast right there at that point. Okay, so back to mo modular grids. So modular grids again act as extensions of multiple column grids. Okay, so we are still using a we are still using column grids, but we're starting to work in modules with the addition of horizontal flow lines, okay? Looking at this graphic over here on the right, we can see that we have um, a couple different flow lines as well, but they're not nearly as strong as the one that we were just working with previously. The result is a page divided into spatial units, otherwise known as modules, okay? Determining modules. Uh, modules can be determined by ideal width or the line length of a paragraph. They can also be determined by the smallest size of a photo or an illustration. So earlier I mentioned if you were to place an image on your sheet, what is the smallest that image can be before it's too small that you can't understand anymore? So if you're doing something like today, if you're doing a four by six inch postcard, how big can that image really be before it starts to lose uh, the quality of the photograph? Okay, so you're already working with something you know, pretty small, so the image really can't be too much smaller, okay? But you might have, we'll say, two or three, uh, you know, images on that on that little sheet that ultimately are kind of the main focal images of that particular graphic, okay? In each case above could span multiple modules. So that's the nice, uh, that's probably my favorite feature of using a modular grid system is that it's really easy to make things smaller and larger. All you gotta do is look at your overall composition and you can easily span them from uh, one module to two, three, four, sometimes even an entire page. So this is a great graphic that I would actually save. I, I Even to this day, I've had this graphic for probably about seven or eight years now and I still look at it probably a couple times a year in terms of organization, especially if you've never created uh, something like a portfolio or any type of graphic. This is a great organization uh, depending on the type of content that you're using, okay? So do you have, the way that you might read this is, okay, do I, first, do I have small, medium, or large images? Okay, I've got mostly medium images, okay? Are my images mostly formatted to square, portrait, landscape, 
okay, uh, most of my images are landscapes. So here gives you a really great organizational uh, you know, method on how to start to arrange the content that you have, okay? You can see here that you have a handful of landscape images along with uh, maybe a title that's running through this area right here and then some supportive text, okay? And then you can continue to look at the others as, as you wish. So modular grids continued, okay? Modular grids can increase compositional uh, flexibility. And we say this is because modular grids work with so much types of information. So whether you have portrait images, landscape images, uh, you know, you can probably rattle off 20 different types of shapes and sizes of graphics that you might want to include. It always works with a modular grid. So it's very flexible to adapt to whatever content that you have. If you were to break this graphic over here to the right, you have one very large image. So uh, let's say, for example, you just created one graphic, okay? You created one, maybe it's a painting, okay? You have a painting that you wanna showcase. There's not multiple variations of it, there's one painting. You might use a nice big square to where that might be broken down into other modules. And the way, when I actually look at this, I can actually see the golden ratio broken down into this, into this section right here being the 0.618 and this section over here being the remainder. Okay, so you'll start to see that golden ratio more and more apparent as we move on to uh, multiple examples. So grid modules must be flexible enough to accommodate changing content over the course of a project. So if you're someone that maybe has a variety of different shapes and sizes of content, maybe you actually have equal amounts of landscape and portrait content. Grids work great and a, with a grid with a good grid system, oh, sorry, a good grid system, your system should be able to accommodate that change throughout the uh, presentation. Alternative grids. So alternative grids would be the second type of grid system that I, that we were going to talk about today. Um, this is definitely more lean towards the more advanced graphic designer. It's definitely on the harder side. Uh, the reason being is because there's no, it's, it is often very loose, it's very organic, but you're very much relying on intuition to create something that's successful. So as much as it could create something really beautiful uh, and really dramatic and really intriguing, it's also really easy to create something that ultimately bombs because it's not organized correctly, okay? So ultimately you're relying on your intuition to tell you whether or not it works uh, well or it doesn't, okay? And so as you get better at trusting your intuition, you'll get better at creating these uh, kind of alternative grid systems, okay? So they often evolve from the basic grid by taking the grids apart, adding, overlapping, shifting, etc. All right. So alternative grids continued. So looking at the different elements that we've talked about, this is kind of a nice little example of kind of dissecting uh, the basic grid system into this alternative grid system where visual elements define the architecture of the page. Compositional structure is often based on dominant and visual element or focal points, okay? So even though this is an example of an alternative grid, you can still start to see a lot of the underlying principles that we've talked about. So you can see a grid here, or I'm sorry, you can see a column here, you can see a column here, and you can even see a column over there on the left-hand side, okay? But they're not super clear and they're not always super apparent, okay? But you still have great things like uh, flow lines, okay? So I would probably call something like I'd probably call this the flow line right here as I have um, as I have a strong vertical, this yellow column, okay? I also have some bold text at the top of the page, okay? Your eye is typically uh, drawn to the top of the page as we're used to reading from top to bottom. And we also have this initial shifting of the different text that's kind of uh, crisscrossing through that point. So my eye is automatically led to design, architecture, art and planning, and then the various hierarchy of text takes you from then uh, the next piece to the next piece. All right, I wish I would have talked about that with the larger image, but uh, you guys are probably starting to see that point. Okay, 
So here's a really nice example of an alternative, or this is of a, of a portfolio spread using alternative grids. So even though they're not using, you know, square, 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 all the way through the entire sheet, um, it's very apparent that they have some key, you know, organizational lines and, and different flowing elements that continue from sheet to sheet to sheet. Okay, you can see here that you have one maybe about right here. Okay, you have one that goes along this area. You still have that same line going down over here. Okay, and uh, you can start to see how you know this line right here starts to relate to this line right here, and that continues throughout the entire spread. So, uh, this this is definitely a harder, um, actually a much harder method of organizing your portfolio. But if done correctly, it can be, you know, very, very successful, uh, you know, and, and a beautiful thing to read, all right? But it takes a lot of practice. It takes a lot of practice and a lot of trusting in yourself to ultimately create something this successful. Yes? I saw this initially as one page and then I thought it might be four pages. It, it actually is, yes, it is four pages. Why, why don't you see how you, or why don't you talk about how you see that? So I do uh, think it's I do think it's four actually four pages and I'll tell you why my, my reason of thinking so we will actually often and I'm actually a big fan of allowing images and text to actually flow from one side to the other but you're right there is a there would be a binding if this was folded in half but that's okay if you place the right elements and the right text uh, in you know strategic parts of the page so right here if you actually look at the second page, you can tell that there's not a lot of uh, information going on where that binding would be. So if you actually, if you were to kind of basically cut out this segment right here, you're not cutting out key visual information, okay? And you can say the same thing about the top image as well, whereas some of your bold red text, some of the, you know, the big pieces of information that are starting to pop in your imagery are more focused on the left and the right and not so much on the center. So we're not placing content in the middle that uh, ultimately, you know, you're, you're not gonna miss the point of it by not reading it, okay? I mean, even something like this, I mean, nobody is gonna go through and read all of this, this little text. You know, does it have some meaning? Maybe, it might. If you actually were to read it, maybe it gives you a little history of, to, this, uh, to this image, but with my experience in looking at portfolios, most people don't read a majority of the text. They might read the, the little bit of text that's you know, big and bold and popping, but that's usually that text is all that you need to ultimately get your, your main point across. So breaking the grid. Grids provide a base, but don't be, yes? I was just curious on the last page how you would crop some of the grid. So last class, and I'll actually show you an example of this today, I think uh, I really quickly took out the pen tool. Remember when we picked out, we pulled out the pen tool. Actually, you know what? I think maybe I only did that with you, didn't I? So that's actually part of today's lecture. I'll, I'll show you guys how to create these uh, various different frames that aren't square, circle, rectangles, etc. So I'll show you how to create these today. So breaking the grid. So breaking or grids provide a base, but don't be afraid to intelligently break the grid. Okay. So the grid is not meant to be a dictator. It's not meant to be something that, you know, once you create it, there's no possible way I can separate myself from it. So some of the strongest points made in a portfolio is when someone intelligently breaks the grid. So there's a good reason and there's a good, uh, there's kind of a rhyme and a reason to why you did it. And it's usually that move that becomes really powerful that makes a statement and draws your eye to that particular image or whatever it is that you're highlighting, okay? So use the grid as a guide, but not as a dictator of the layout, okay? If it is broken too often, it is probably not for the right content. So if you find yourself just constantly like, okay, my grid's not working here. I'm gonna shift it a little bit more to the right. It's also not really working here. So if you find yourself in that particular predicament, your grid's probably not correct in the first place. So if you're gonna break it, Break it once, maybe break it twice, but you want to do it 
frequent enough, I'm not, sorry, not frequent enough so that it becomes um, a focal part of your, of your layout. So the interaction of visual elements. So first we're gonna talk a little bit about hierarchical development, okay? So we talk about hierarchy because it establishes a clear focal point that attracts the eye, okay? So if we look at this image over here on the right, do I have a blow up? I don't have a blow up. But if you look at this image over here on the right, what's the first thing that we're drawn to? I guess it is a lizard. I don't think that's. I don't think that's the. That's the. That's the answer. Something. Yeah, it's probably something. So it's your, your eye is being led to the first word in the title of. He he thinks it's definitely the lizard. It's the contrast. Actually, I'll I'll even argue that the first thing that you're probably drawn to is probably actually the color in the background behind something for or something from nothing. So your eye is drawn to this portion of the page to which you then look over to something uh, from nothing and then the text gets smaller and you start to kind of, uh, you know, branch out to the other elements of the page. The Do you immediately Thank look you. at the lizard? Thank you. Okay, okay, maybe it's the lizard, maybe it's the lizard. Maybe we argue that it's the lizard because it's so different from everything else that's going on, on the page that maybe you look at the lizard, okay? So then it goes uh, to, you know, maybe it's the color Maybe it's then at the text, so on and so forth. So hierarchical development can meld the subordinate visual elements that allow for in-depth view of topic. This leads the viewer throughout a logical and meaningful journey of that particular spread. Okay, so that journey that we just little that we just went on from the lizard to the color to the text. That's the logical journey that is the intended journey that whoever created that document wants the viewer to. Uh, go through okay so hierarchy continued hierarchy if if hierarchy is not established your eye will easily get distracted and overloaded and moved on so when something is not clear and if the hierarchy is not easily established it's very easy to just uh, to get distracted and move on so uh, you know we're, we're a busy we're a busy uh, you know group of people these days we got so much overload in terms of visual synthesis in our life that it's it's so easy especially for the younger generation me included to easily get distracted so if these things aren't done correctly it's very easy to get distracted and you and you easily move on okay so if you look at this image right here what would we what would we say is maybe the 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 main hierarchical element of the image that probably draws your attention yeah, the flower, definitely the flower. So the flower, it's the pop of color. It's what initially grabs your attention to look at this poster, if it was on a wall. If you were just walking by, even though the rest of the text is, you know, has a really strong sense of hierarchy, you probably would it probably wouldn't grab your attention without the flower. So there's a really pop, you know, really nice pop of pink, blue that ultimately grabs your attention, and then your eye starts to go from piece to piece to piece. So your, thought, your eye then goes to Nas National Portfolio Day, then you could argue that you probably go to California College of the Arts, then the date, the place, then you come down over here to maybe some supporting text, and then et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, we all see how that works. So what does that all lead to? We look at this, that all leads to a really nice little rule that I always like to refer to called the 12 6 Three, one rule okay this refers to 12 feet six feet three feet one feet so if we look back at this image right here what's the element that grabs your attention at 12 feet it's the flower okay so what is it that if this was a 11 by 17 image posted on a wall okay so maybe it's posted over there on that wall I could see that flower from even though I'm a lot more than 12 feet I could still easily see that flower from a larger distance. So that flower catches your attention, you walk a little bit closer, you then see something at six feet, that grabs your attention more, and so on and so forth to where you're now standing right in front of the poster and you're reading all of the fine details and the next thing you know you're at the lecture series, okay? So let's analyze the same, this same uh, sheet in terms of the 12-6-3-1 rule. What do we think uh, grabs our attention you know, at 12 feet. 
Yeah, the bird, I would probably just say probably all of the graphics over kind of on this side of the, sh of the, of the sheet. You could probably argue that maybe it's the contrast between this bird right here and maybe the white cloud and the blue. It's really bold, it pops a lot. So that's what grabs you at 12 feet. Then you have uh, the bold text on the top that's wrapped around this yellow frame uh, that talks about where the portfolio day uh, is and then you have you know where it's located the location and then you know additional information as you get right up to it okay so that's a great example of that rule so and so when you when you're creating your your exercise what did I say 11 or 12 extra whatever today about the DVC advertisement uh, you'll actually break that rule down into a little bit different okay you're actually gonna break that rule down to maybe like the three foot, one foot. Maybe it's six, three, one, because you're not going to be, you're not going to grab someone's attention with a little card that's this big from 12 feet away. Maybe you would. Maybe someone holds it up and it grabs your attention. So you could probably still ask yourself that question, but you're actually focusing maybe more on what grabs your attention uh, right when you're kind of holding it in front of your face. Okay. So hierarchy, uh, getting started with hierarchy. So the first thing that you're gonna do, uh, and we're starting to relate this to actually what, uh, close to what we're doing today for today's exercise and even for assignment three, is you wanna rank the different data that you're placing on your sheet in terms of visual importance, okay? So what's the most important thing that we look at on this poster over here on the right? It's the main subject, it's the main heading of what it is that we're advertising. That's the National Portfolio Day. That's the main subject. So that's visual importance number one. The next thing is usually, you know, where is it located and the date and the time of when it is, okay? So usually the date's always really big because you can easily just look at it and your brain tells you, are you available, are you not available, etc., etc. Oh, I'm available? Okay, well I can then start to go into the other elements that are ranked a little bit lower. Maybe it's uh, the attendees or who's going to be there and some of the other other pertinent information. OK, so support or subordinate elements will occupy the middle ground and the background. So things like uh, things like visual graphics, maybe it be some color, some type of a graphic that might be in the background that helps grab your attention, um, you know, kind of your initial attention. But ultimately, when we look at this image, even though that background, uh, it's supportive, but it's not the main top, it's not the main importance of this image. It's because, uh, the reason why is because you have this big, bold, white text that's right over the green background. So even though the green is definitely a bold, loud color, the white over it is what contrasts the most that ultimately grabs your attention, okay? So it's ultimately acting as a background that helps the more important thing pop even more. So compositional factors include contrast, orientation, scale, quantity, linear elements, depth, perspective, position, color, graphic shapes, dimension, tension, typography, typography. I always want to highlight typography. So when we actually look at all of these different elements that we've talked about today, just you know, kind of refresh yourself in terms of our last lecture, in terms of how important uh, text and typography really is. If all of the if all of the text and the font for all of these different elements were all way off, you know, just kind of think about how boring these these graphics could easily become. If you made like all of the text Times New Roman, or or if you know you had no hierarchy between all the text, you would start to see how dull that would easily become. So I always really like to emphasize the importance of typography. Okay. Next, we have space, okay, space. Space provides visual contrast uh, between uh, the various elements in, uh, in, a, uh, in a graphic. It contributes to an effective and over, overlying ordering system, okay? Empty space brings elements alive. So when we talk about empty space, we'll actually, we'll, we're gonna dwell on the importance of of uh, the difference between positive and negative space over the next several weeks, especially as we get towards the portfolio. But you'll realize that how important uh, a lot of the empty space actually becomes. That empty space actually can become, you know, and sometimes the most important organizational element uh, of the sheet, okay? So we actually look at the empty space here between the two groups of text. 
that becomes a very important organizational element. But you'll realize that um, it's not always super important to just fill up a document with a whole bunch of stuff. Okay, so that leads me to, um, if I had my pen and I could had my other computer, I'd be able to draw on this, but fortunately I don't. So that leads us to our, uh, a couple of our next important uh, topics in terms of space. Um, sorry, I lost my train of thought there for a second. Uh, so continuing on positive and negative space. So when I look at this graphic over here on the right hand side, Probably the most important thing, yes, you know, this text really, really popped, but probably the, one of the most important uh, visual elements is probably this space right here in the middle. This space, this empty void space or negative space, as we called it in our last slide, ultimately draws our eye to the middle or kind of this middle area of this graphic. And then from there, because our eyes naturally go from top to bottom, you start to read down, master, pieces you realize that this is broken off and you can see that it continues up here at the at the top and then we have these nice little clippings of these different uh, this different graphics that we have here okay so space is imperative for accessibility and navigation of the eye so good ordered space whether it be negative or positive is uh, is imperative in terms of where your eye ultimately starts okay so space directs the eye to positive or visual areas of focus okay so using space so how do we all use space space can be organized into groups of elements together to provide a focal point okay so depending on how your space is organized this ultimately can create the focal point so that focal point for our last slide was that area right there above the word master okay centering an object or I'm sorry centering an object equalizes space around it rendering the space ineffective so this is when I really want to draw on something so the reason being is let's say that this is sorry I'll kind of I'll go I'll rotate myself here just a second let's say that this is our sheet right here okay so this is we'll say that our portfolio is like 10 inches by 10 inches if we place our um, element here in the middle, okay, first of all, the element's too small. We probably have too much space around it in terms of filling it up with other content, okay? But if our image is even larger, let's say we fill it up to something that's about this size. Maybe it occupies like 75% of our page. Well, because this object is centered, it's actually not really centered, I drew a really poor centered square. Because the object is centered, you're actually leaving yourself with really, inact or really inadequate space all around the sides, okay? Our margins become kind of the area that we have left over to put text or supportive imagery. But as you can see, when you place something in the middle, it becomes really hard to do that. So everyone here has heard of the rule of thirds, we talked about it earlier in the semester, to where if you were to place that image over here, maybe on the left-hand side, maybe that same image, same exact size, is placed down here, you start to have really nice, uh, really nice space left over to actually start to uh, place other important elements, whether it be text, whether it be maybe a supportive image up here, uh, etc. So rule of thirds, always remember that one. So placing in, you know, as I began to continue talking about, placing an image off center creates weighted asymmetrical composition, okay? That leaves you nice amounts of adequate space to start to place other, um, other important information. Don't have too much space, okay? So when I first drew that image real small on the, on the sheet, so if your images aren't placed on the right scale, the right size, um, you may end up having too much space where your eye is, is distracted and doesn't really know where to start. All right, again, I wish I had my pen tool. I would do a couple demonstrations. So scale, next we have scale. Scale is another example in t of uh, how you might start to create hierarchy, okay? Hierarchy is not just used when it comes to text, okay? 
hierarchy or can be used for text. It could also be used for images, okay? So then it brings us to scale, whether it be text or images, sorry. Uh, scale can be used to establish hierarchy. It can also be used as, or it can be used as a method of consistency and progression uh, when changing scale. So if you look at the image over here on the right, okay, we have scale in terms of typography. We also have scale in terms of imagery, okay? So if we look at the text, we can see here that we have the large bold text over the red background. That's what our eye is first drawn to. Then we have slightly smaller text down here, and it gets smaller and smaller as we get to the bottom. So there's a very clear organizational hierarchy for the text. But we can also say the exact same thing about the graphics. Okay, if we look at the graphics, we say, all right, there's one really big bold graphic on the, on the uh, you know, probably like 75, 80% of the page. That's, uh, you know, that's the main topic of what it is they created this flyer for. But then you have a little graphic down here, okay, that supports maybe the idea that this is about dance or something like that. Then you have a little graphic down here, and then you have little smaller graphics that start to support um, the text and the other graphic above, okay? So we have, um, we have a clear hierarchy in terms of scale for both the text and the imagery on our sheet, okay? So start to, uh, you know, I'll go back to when I started, when I, when I talked about numbering and starting to identify what the important things are, you know, this would be a great, uh, a great example of when you could do that, okay? Quantity, all right? Next we have quantity. Too many elements on a sheet uh, is, is equal or equivalent to visual clutter and lack of order. So um, especially if this is this, you know, I talked about this especially in terms of young designers. Uh, I, I definitely did my, I did this myself when I was younger, when I first started school. Um, it's really easy to put too much content on a sheet where it's much, much more important to focus on one specific topic Maybe you have a couple supporting images that support that initial concept, but it's very easy to have too much content on your sheet. So make sure all elements have a specific function, okay? If you have text and you have images on a, on a sheet, make sure, they're all uh, make sure they're all supporting one specific question, okay? Or, whether, or whatever it is that you're trying to showcase. Uh, a couple different uh, methods that you might use to determine whether or not you have too little or too much content is the subtractive or the additive uh, method, okay? Uh, me personally, I usually work with the subtractive method. This is where you have a layout and you place a whole bunch of content on there and then you start to kind of slowly take away those elements until, you're, until your intuition kind of says, yep, that's the right amount right there. Maybe you add one back, yeah, that's a little bit too much, it starts to become a little too much clutter. Maybe you re remove a couple and okay, yeah, it's not quite telling a story the way that I want it to. So you ultimately subtract elements till you get to where you feel you're the most comfortable. The additive would be the opposite, where you start with one object, you place another, okay, that's not quite, um, that's not quite enough. Okay, I add one more, yep, that's it right there. That's, that's what I'm going after. Okay, so that's quantity. So lastly, we're getting towards the end. I think we only have a couple more slides here. We have orientation and position, okay? Orientation and position can lead to strong contrast that enhance uh, hierarchy, okay? So this slide ultimately refers back to a lot of what we were talking about, we're talking about in the beginning, okay? So here we don't have real clear columns, okay? But you start to see that contrast between the vertical and the horizontal horizontal elements, okay? So if you were to actually apply some of those initial elements that we were talking about, you could probably argue that maybe you have a column here, maybe this is a column here. You could probably argue that her arm is a column or probably a strong vertical element along with her face. But you can see here that we have a clash between her arm and the horizontal elements running through the middle of the screen. So that clash between the horizontal and the vertical act as that focal point of where our eye is drawn to. So we look at that spot and we see Dreamer and, uh, or Dreamer 
am a true and then you restart to read the, the you know the rest of the text okay so an example all elements are or, are oriented horizontally a vertical orientation would stand out or otherwise uh, be emphasized and of course don't forget diagonals diagonals could do the exact same thing so instead of a vertical element you might have a diagonal element that ultimately starts to create that focal point so depth dimension and perspective so this is something that um, this was an organizational element that was used quite a bit probably from like 2008 to 2000 and like 12 maybe like 2014 um, where perspective engages the compositional space of the page you started to see a lot of graphics with like embossing you started to see gradients if you looked at we'll actually have um, a lecture here in about two weeks where we talk about logos we talk about we'll actually talk about apple as a great case study of how apple is always on like the trending forefront of of these different styles well they were actually a great example of when they did this but now we're very much lean towards kind of the flat uh the more flatter look where we're not look we're not really using a lot of gloss or embossing you're not really creating um graphic elements that have you know that kind of perspective but it can still be used as you know successfully okay uh dimension or perspective moves the composition away from the flat and layering elements can also create depth okay you can see here that in this graphic we have you know uh, something over here in the in the foreground and you start to have other supporting elements as they travel to the background and moving to the end typography don't forget of course to pay attention or careful attention to, to typography typography is important as the other as the other visual elements of the compos or composition okay always continue to think about the macro and the micro scales we talked about that when we were talking about typography in terms of of the of the larger organizational image and the smaller supportive ones as well okay color color can provide visual interest all right it can also emphasize specific elements on a page okay uh, color can be uh, used as compre as a color can use a comprehensive color palette or just one or two colors you can see here uh, and actually one of my personal preferences when we're doing graphic design um, and you'll notice this is actually a great example of, of, of when we talked about flat from that last slide okay this is a great example of flat you know flat graphics we don't we know we have flat colors in the background but we have color up here on the top that creates that strong visual contrast from what's going on. So you have blue, you have black, you have red, but that's definitely the focal element in terms of just the very basic white box over here on the bottom. So one of my preferences is actually to make um, something like a portfolio. So if you're referring to this as a, you know, an example as the portfolio, I like to have very little color in my, in my portfolio and I like to let color act as the element that allows something to pop or something that is creating visual cues throughout the page whether it be uh, you know a little ribbon of color in the corner maybe that ribbon of color leads you to the title or maybe it's a little pop of color in the graphic that you're showcasing that ultimately creates the visual interest so I like to typically show um, very monotone colors and then allow maybe one color to allow something to pop all right so graphic shapes and linear elements can be used to support primary content okay so something like this x right there might be a graphic shape that is supporting uh, other contents um, this is often directs the viewer towards important areas okay so an example of a pop of you know a very small pop of color that might be used a great example of that is right here so I would actually prefer maybe to have less color over here in the background and then allow maybe this X here to be that little pop of color that draws you to the title of the page a bold graphic shape can then serve as a background of the composition while still supporting other elements okay so this as an example we have a bigger one no this as an example is a little bit too loud for me Although this X does draw my attention to it, I think it would be a little bit more successful. 
if there wasn't so much color or maybe it was a little bit more uh, monotone version of this to where that title started to pop a little bit more. So in review, the designer must create hierarchy, order and control of the design. They must, uh, a designer must use contrast to establish focal areas. And lastly, use compositional factors to support design. Okay, so just to kind of wrap this up. I just have a couple quick slides here of a portfolio. I'm not gonna dwell on this too much. I think I'll actually have this, these slides again when we talk about the portfolio. But as I flip through them, think about the different organizational elements that we've talked about this lecture. So think about the organizational columns. Think about the column intervals. Think about the grids. Think about the flow lines. Okay, so you can easily see those column inner or those columns in the different page. You can see how the grids are working. You can even see that flow line. And then also pay attention how they jump from sheet to sheet, okay? And pay attention to how they might even break, okay? So you can see here going from page to page, you still have a very consistent flow line running through that sheet, okay? You can see how that line continues from one page to the next, and you still have the strong graphic elements on one side of them, okay? Here's a nice break in that grid where they break that up a little bit, okay? couple strong flow lines this uh, this um, this dimension right here is very much equal to you know very similar dimension in the previous sheets okay so even though they're breaking that grid system they're still sticking to the overall proportions so they're very successful in terms of that there's another recollection or a recollection of that flow line all right we still have a couple strong columns so you can kind of see how that continues to work from sheet to sheet to sheet. Okay, so that's it. Let's stop there. Let's take a 10 minute break. Let's come back at eight o'clock. We'll talk for about 15, 20 minutes in terms of InDesign. We'll talk about how to use some tools and we'll talk about how we can create uh, some of these different grids.